Hello everyone, this is Frank DeFreitas, and I would like to welcome you to another broadcast of Holotalk, the Internet's laser and holography broadcast, or commonly known today as a podcast. My guest for this installment of Holotalk is a man I greatly admire for the type of work he does in holography, and his name is John Clare. Now, John has a rather unusual approach to holography in the fact that he goes outside of his own laser lab and down into caves deep within the darkness, and he takes a portable system, which he developed himself, down into these caves and makes holograms inside the caves. Now, this, to me, is absolutely fascinating. I mean, how many holographers do we have in the world? quite a few not as many as photographers but there's quite a few holographers John is a singular holographer in the fact that I don't know of that many or any that I can recall offhand that actually has a portable system and goes make and goes to make holograms out in the world but John does and it's a fascinating aspect of holography holography for me and it always has been with the work that John has done and it was an honor to be able to have him come and visit us last year when we were working on the Civil War Holography Project in Jacksonville, Florida at Inglewood High School. And John came from his home in Georgia to Jacksonville, Florida and spent a day with us and, the you know, with the students. And he brought his uh, first prototype for his uh, what he calls holography camera with him and set that up and showed us how it works and we're just totally fascinated by it and he has recently made some very impressive holograms laser transmission holograms inside uh, the caves now he's been doing this for years this isn't something that's new he's been doing this for years I mean I think I first met John after I came onto the internet in the mid 90s and he was already doing this. So I left a note on uh, one of his personal pages that uh, it's very similar to the images that were sent back from the moon and sent back from Mars. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that. And one day there's going to be a rover on Mars and it's going to be able to send back probably via digital data um, holographic images uh, of the Martian surface and rocks and to me, I mean, to the rest of the world, that's going to be totally fascinating, especially if those holograms are synthesized, you know, uh, via digital technology into actual holograms and possibly even reproduced on magazine covers for everyone to see. They'll be totally fascinated saying, wow, this is a rock from Mars, you know, and I'm seeing this as a hologram in front of me on this magazine cover. And it's going to, to me, it's going to be, well, you know, this man has been doing this for years. You know, this is nothing new. I just hope the world doesn't forget what John Clare not only has done, but what he's doing right now at this moment in our own life lifetimes uh, as you're sitting here listening to this. So without further ado, let me turn the interview over to uh, John Clare. Now, this interview was conducted back in December, right before, immediately before I took a break for the uh, holiday season. And basically, I had to edit it, which I have done, and now I had to do an introduction, which I'm now completing with this. But it's been long overdue. I know John's been waiting for it. I've been waiting for it. Uh, now, John is a rather soft-spoken man. He's not as outgoing and flamboyant as you find me when I'm out somewhere or on the show here. Um, so... Uh, he's rather quiet in the interview, so there's. I tried to, you know, boost his voice as much as possible, but uh, he's very humble in what he has done, and uh, he's a wonderful guy to know. So, w without saying any more, I will turn the interview over to, uh, will turn you over to the interview with John Clare. And as always, thank you for listening to Holo Talk. Here's John Clare. Hello, John. How are you? It's Frank DeFreitas. Yeah, hey, Frank. How you doing? You doing good tonight? Yeah. Terrific. Good. Terrific. Good, you know, another Monday morning coming up. Great. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, it's good to have you on the show. Uh -huh. And I know a lot of listeners are going to be looking forward to hearing all it is that you're going to say about doing your cave holography. And I was uh -huh. wondering if we could start off with that, 
telling the listeners a little bit about what you do with cave holography and also some of the new discoveries you've made with your new pieces of equipment. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, cave holography is something I've been interested in for a very long time, almost as long as I've been caving, which is real long. <laughs> uh, I guess I started uh, caving back in the late 60s or something, and ever since I've uh, knew, known about holography, I've been uh, think about cave holography, and I have tried it you know, way back in the 70s with the uh, cruder uh, helium neon lasers and power supplies ahead back then didn't have much success and uh, uh, a few years uh, ago I done it again with another helium neon laser uh, doing just a simple uh, one beam reflection holograms with the you know, nicer power supplies we have nowadays had a great success with that and, and uh I've been trying to do the two-beam transmission holograms because I'm just impressed with the image you have in a transmission hologram. It's, uh, you can get an image that's actually bigger than the plate. Uh, a transmission hologram, as you know, is like a window that you're looking through, a, a big scene behind it. Yeah, exactly. Uh-huh, and the, the image is always nice and, uh, how would I say, uh, sharp. Mm-hmm. As long as you're using a laser, <laughs> yes. To, uh, try to play it back. Uh, but I hadn't had a whole lot of luck uh, making a transmission hologram until just a few weeks ago. Uh, there, were, I would uh, try to set up in the lab at home, and it seemed to work okay. And I'd go to the cave and try it, and for some reason, uh, I was getting very uh, weak images. What do you think the problem was there? Um, I'm trying to figure out. I, I thought, well, maybe the cave just inherently isn't stable enough, and maybe you know, I was just foolish to uh, try it. And, uh, uh, you know, because uh, doing well, you, you have had some luck doing holograms in caves, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, the one beam uh, reflection, but I guess yeah. you can probably do a one beam reflection just about any place, probably. Mm-hmm. With, uh, just minimum uh, stability requirements. And then... Uh, like I said, just a few weeks ago, I finally had some good luck at it. Uh, um, I was using plates this time instead of film. I see. So uh, plates, I guess, are just a lot more stable, a lot more expensive, too. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess over to Thanksgiving weekend, I uh, shot a few in this uh, cave in North Georgia and uh, came home and developed them. And got, you know, some mediocre results. I mean, they were better than I did before. And then I uh, went back again this past weekend and did it again and uh, I guess just made longer exposures. And I'm very happy with the results this time. Yeah, and that's, uh, the pictures that you had sent mm-hmm. is from this uh, recent outing. Is that correct? The recent what? The recent uh, trip to the caves. Yeah, that's right. the that picture you sent Sunday. this time. Yeah. And um uh, I'm using a more compact apparatus than I had before. The, the other uh, thing, I had everything on a breadboard. Uh, I started out using a spatial filter for the reference beam. And uh, Did you run into problems doing that? Well, you know, a space filter is persnickety no matter what. <laughs> mm-hmm. And when you're in a nasty environment like a cave and all messing around with it. It's just all that much more trouble. Yeah, some people could lose their mind trying to figure out a spatial filter. Yeah. That was a... But, uh... I had uh, done other experiments with fiber optics, uh, and I found that uh, with this uh, green laser, the DPSS type of laser, it's a coherent 315 is the... uh, exact brand, uh, but he has an extremely long coherence length, and so running into a multi-mode fiber, even if the fiber does scramble it up, apparently when you start out with hundreds of feet of coherence, even if you scramble it up down to, what, maybe 10 feet of coherence, which mm-hmm. is with it, you still get a decent coherence out of the end of the fiber. So I was just using that to, uh, after a little uh, Edmund Beam splitter, uh, bringing it up and around, and uh, just what comes out of the end of the fiber just comes out as a cone. You know, just 
Yeah. The diverging. Uh, it's got a little bit of its own mode pattern in it, but after you bleach the hologram, you don't even notice it. No kidding. Really. That's good. And I was afraid that, you know, some of the parts would be brighter than others and all, but it really doesn't show up much at all. And when, you look, and when you look at that hologram, it's almost like you're back in that cave again, isn't it? Yeah. At that sp- you know, particular spot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a weird thing about using the fiber optic. Uh, when you develop the film before you bleach it, uh, it looks like somebody just splattered paint on it. It's, yeah, I see. Like, oh, man, this is hopeless. This uh, can't be a good hologram. And after you bleach it, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Now you the s- fiber also scrambles up the... Uh, Polarization of laser, too. But yet you still get bright results, right? Yeah. And then I've also been uh, using uh, what's called an engineered diffuser to spread my beam out. You know, I've tried on all kinds of different lenses, all little ball lenses, all trying to spread it out enough to uh, light up the whole scene. And then I tried an opal diffusing glass, which makes a nice, even illumination, but it's spreads out so much that you know, there's just not enough reflecting back to uh, expose the hologram in a reasonable amount of time. Yeah, it spreads out pretty quick over a short distance, yeah, doesn't right. it? Yeah, it probably goes like you know, 180 degrees. Yeah. So these engineering diffusers, uh, I imagine there's several different companies that make them, but the one I'm using is by a company called Luminit, L-U-M-I-N-I-T, I think, Luminit. Uh, they're called light shaping diffusers. They sell them uh, different diffusing patterns. Uh, some of them uh, diffuse into a round shape. Some of them into an elliptical shape. Uh, so it's am- it's amazing how they can shape the beam by using those sheets. Yeah. They, it's apparently, uh, I don't know exactly how they do it, but they, their literature shows you know micro photographs of the surface and it's uh, little tiny uh, like bumps. Uh, <laughs> I guess they shape the sh- the bumps in a certain direction uh, to cause the the light to go whichever way they want. I guess it's a yeah. diffraction of some sort. But, um, Do you plan on going back into the cave and doing a series of these holograms? I'm not, sure. I'm not down here this weekend. I, you know, occasionally I do have to do some things at home, and uh, yeah. probably next weekend I'll go back down again, uh, caving or something. I do, you know, a few days every month anyhow. <laughs> it would be great if you could get an exhibit of this stuff. Mm-hmm. I would love to see these pieces. I, I'm always fascinated with what it is that you do. Right. You know, going into caves and doing cave holography. That's that's John Clare. That, that's your own field. Well, <laughs> uh, I'm just hoping some other people might, uh, you know, get inspired by this and not necessarily, you know, do it in a cave, but, you know, try someplace else, you know, find something else out in nature or something that's available that maybe on a dark night uh, you can make a hologram of uh, some weird rock formations or something. Or, uh, maybe some historical thing of some sort. Or maybe just uh, put a tent over it to make it dark, whatever. But, yeah. Uh, Michael Harrison, another person uh, I know, he lives down in Texas, and I think he tried doing uh, some holograms on a beach one time, I guess, mm-hmm. shells or something. Yeah. I don't think he had too good a success with it. Yeah, I think I think there's been a few people that have actually gone out and made a few outdoor hologram. But what you do is almost like a little field unto yourself. I mean, they, they go out, they try their hologram, they make their hologram, and then they go back to whatever else it was they were doing and experimenting with and moving on to other things. But you've been doing this for so many years that this is basically almost like your own field. Well, I just don't want to give up on it. And, uh, uh, caving is something I love to do. Holography is something I love to do. So I'm just fortunate that I got two interests that, you know, just managed to come together. What what would your plans for the future be with this? Anything? Uh, make better ones. Um, How about larger ones? You, yeah. you foresee yourself doing perhaps 8x10s? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've right now, I, what I'm doing, I think, is 4-inch uh, by 4-inch. It's just because the plates I had... Uh, um, I've cut them down like it's just a convenient size with the 
standard plates are four by five. Now, how did four by four make them more convenient? <laughs> um, the apparatus I put together, the platen that I'm using to hold the film. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I looked around, thinking, you know, what can I use to, you know, a nice stable piece of material to put the film against? And I found a, a I guess, a cover from an electrical box. Okay. That was the shape of it, four inch by four inch. I see. <laughs> so I uh, so you cut glass. Felt you... over it and uh, incorporated it into my apparatus. Did you cut glass plates down to the four by four? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I bought some uh, plates from Jiang that were uh, some odd size. They weren't even eight by ten. They were uh, some strange size. And that's why I got a deal on them. Uh, I think somebody ordered them and then you know, got the special order, but didn't pay for them or something, so you oh. with them, so uh, I think their oldest can be, too, I think they're manufactured in 2003, and here it is, almost 2009, I'm using them, and yeah. so that says something about the VRP plates, that they have a long shelf life. I've never had any difficulties working with holographic plates that were past their expiration date, there's always a way that you can figure out to work with them, whether it's a pre-soak or whatever it is, increasing exposure to compensate for the age. But you can get good holograms out of plates that are even more than 10 years old. Easy. Yeah, well, I've got some uh, stuff around here that's probably more than 10 years old. <laughs> um, anyhow, uh, talking about the reflection or the transmission holograms, uh, another uh, nice thing nowadays is uh, little red diodes are cheap. So yeah. That used to be a problem with uh, transmission holograms is how are you going to play it back? Well, you're going to have to use a laser. Well, nowadays, you know, <laughs> a red laser doesn't cost any more than a, a flashlight. You know? mm -hmm. So you're you're shooting them in green, and now you're going to illuminate them with red. Right. Okay. Yeah, I've done that myself. I find that to be pretty convenient because I have a 100 milliwatt green here. Mm -hmm. And I've, sh I've shot some green holograms, and then just for convenience, illuminate them even with just a laser pointer. Uh -huh. And it doesn't necessarily have to be any type of a non-mode hopping type of diode or anything. You just need the light to illuminate the hologram. So yeah, you, you can use any oh. diode that's out there. Right, yeah, it doesn't matter if it mode hops or not. You just use it as illumination. And another nice thing about the little red diodes is they just naturally come out spread already and clean as can be. Yeah. Any other questions about the cave holography? Mm, I don't think I have any other questions. When, how long? How many years have you been doing this now? Oh, when did you? What year did you shoot your first cave hologram? Well, my attempts were way back in the 1970s, but actually, uh, having any success was uh, more recently. It's probably uh, so I can't remember the exact date, but sometime in the 1990s. So uh, I did the. Uh, uh, one beam uh, reflections. Okay. Um, then the other uh, light shaping diffuser is, I think, the uh, trick now with this. Because uh, when you're throwing the energy out and you need to have a certain amount come back, uh, you can t control with these things, you know, how much of an area you're covering. Yeah. So start with 100 milliwatts, if you spread it out over. 180 degrees, you're not getting anything back with this. If you're shooting a, a beam of uh, only 30 degrees wide, you do have quite a bit coming back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the pictures that you that you sent were uh, very bright. Mm -hmm. Now, what was that, a rock formation? It looks almost like it, as if it could be one of those underwater photographs, too. <laughs> yeah. That could be an option for you, getting involved with this and make, making it uh, watertight and doing something underwater. Pictures I sent you. Uh, I think I pointed out that uh, it was the thing to the right there. Uh, we call it a uh, drapery formation. It's just the way the limestone, uh, you know, formed over the eons that, that, that made a thing called a drapery. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, I thought it was just an interesting thing to take a picture of. But uh, there are much more beautiful things in caves. It's just. Uh, I'm, experimenting right now, and that's a cave that's easy to get in, well, relatively easy to get into. I still have to rappel into it, but yeah. I'd love to have one I could just park my car and walk into. Oh, wouldn't that be something? But then that wouldn't be caving anymore, <laughs> would it? Stuff. 
Now, have you sh have you displayed these to any other cave enthusiasts? And, and if you have, what has their reaction been? Well, I just shot them uh, last Sunday, and the, there's only uh, three people, uh, others my wife, uh, and you now that's seen them, as uh, uh, the person that owns the cave and uh, two other cavers. I'm, I'm a big fan of yours. I like what it is that you do. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, I, f I find it really interesting. I've, I've right, always well, found I'll, it interesting. I'll see if I can't send along one of my holograms to you to take a look at the real thing. Well, I'll tell you what. You you send the hologram to me, and I'll make sure that when I go out on the road, I'll make sure that I take it with me and other people see it and give you credit that you did it. All right. Thank you. you. Know? <laughs> you know, we'll get a lot of different people from a lot of different parts of the United States to take a look at it. <laughs> be safe, though. Be safe. All right. We'll talk to you later. All right, John. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye.